when we think about innovations and um, opportunities in energy, we get a, a really a wide range of features. And uh, California and University of California, Berkeley and LBL have a long history of working on energy efficiency issues. And every now and then, efficiency takes the national stage. This is a, a poster from World War II. And a decade ago, Bill Maher chose to update it um, for another recent event. So efficiency itself can, can really become a key issue when the time is right. And I certainly hope the time is right again, because we've seen dramatic technological, but also market and political innovations in a whole range of areas. This one obviously takes kind of a big, uh, a big picture, uh, in your face version of the story. But um, features that are more subtle and are on the cutting edge of science, and we'll have, uh, we'll have a talk on biomass. We've looked at not only the potential for biofuels to play a large role, but we've also seen really active debates around the different uses of food materials for energy, for, for, for food and for fiber, um, and for needs around the world. And these needs are often quite varied as we look uh, from developed to developing nations, a theme that will come up again and again. And so our lab and many others have looked at the life cycle of biofuels, both in terms of the science. And Berkeley is very proud to host the Energy Bioscience Institute, a major UC Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and University of Illinois Band of Champaign collaborative effort in these areas. We also have technologies we don't have a speaker on, but are certainly part of the mix. And so thinking about topics in nuclear power, um, a technology that we're not allowed to build more of in California right now um, until there is a national waste solution. But thinking about the mix of technologies and the curve of binding energy uh, made made more famous perhaps by John, by John's book is a part of that, that equation. We also have assessments that mix where science is going with dramatic visions of scale up. And so a project that took place a few years ago with the uh, somewhat food channel inspired, I guess Bobby Flay inspired the gigaton throwdown challenge looked at what would it take to scale a number of technologies to really large scale. And it, it's gotten a, a number of uh, important looks um, from our various national laboratories as well as private groups in terms of what would it take to scale many of our technologies to really large scale application around the world. We also have thinking about what are the impacts of a variety of technologies, both positive in terms of energy supply options and in terms of their cradle to grave, their life cycle impact. Um, and so thinking about what those footprints are is also a place where a number of the speakers today have really key insights and have led laboratory groups examining what is the, the footprint of the current boom in the gas industry? What is the, the impact of dramatic scale-ups in wind or solar um, and, uh, and offshore technologies? And again, that will also be part of the conversation tonight. We have efforts that have um, scaled up to United Nations significance, a current uh, push of not only the head of the UN, but also the World Bank is to think about how do we bring these technologies not only to advanced economies, but to the billion and a half people who don't have electricity, um, and another billion who have access, but it's either very expensive or intermittent. So the number of different opportunities to think on a mixture of the science and the global political level is also part of what we will look at tonight as we, um, as we, as we uh, go through the conversation. Um, I realize I didn't turn on my... Uh, let that be a lesson to our speakers not to do what I did, and that is to forget to push the unmute button. Um, so we have a whole range of technologies and of applications. We'll hear about what's taken place in solar, wind, biomass, um, and ocean energy, not only in terms of the innovations, but how they translate into practice. And how much does a scientific innovation really lead to changes in what gets deployed and how fast does that happen? And all of these are going to be parts of what we need to achieve to reach the scale of clean energy deployment that the climate science community says we need, which is more or less an 80% decarbonization, not from where we are today, but from where we were in 1990 by mid-century. And so think about how these technologies fit together will be one of the themes. And it's why we need both cutting edge science, but also cutting edge opportunities to deploy these technologies. Well, once again, I'd like to thank our speakers. And let me just uh, cl uh, close with a few comments. And one thing which I think you saw across all of these talks is that in the energy field, because there is such both a need 
to, to drive new innovation, but also deployment, that all of our speakers are really not only at the cutting edge of their own work in their particular area, whether it's solar, wind, ocean, biofuels, uh, but they're also thinking very hard about the integration questions. And one of the areas that we didn't talk about explicitly, but is really in, inherent in all the comments, um, Henry highlighted in particular in his, was the need and the new technologies to find ways to integrate many different technologies together, uh, both to integrate in renewables into our current system. Paul, for example, highlighted the remarkable numbers in Germany where they had a 50% of their energy mix from, uh, from solar, one technology, but also uh, how are we going to integrate in with our current energy system today, but transition that one to the dramatically decarbonized and potentially much more distributed systems that we're talking about in the future. And so we get all kinds of interesting examples, and part of it comes from basic science, but part of it comes from some very interesting lessons about learning from one technology area into another. So uh, to come back to some of the comments that Belinda mentioned, one of the technologies that our laboratory here at UC Berkeley has been really fascinated with is a company in Australia came up with yet another ocean energy technology. It's essentially a big metal sphere attached to the bottom of the ocean that has fresh water in it, and it, and it bobs back and forth due to, uh, due to the difference in densities. Well, they were deploying this technology. It's a company called Carnegie Energy in Perth, and they were using this as, a, as an energy produ production system. But they noticed that the pressure in the lines they can get by this system allows them to not only generate energy with the high pressure version of the cycle, but the bottoming cycle, the exit pressure, allows them to produce fresh water using doing by reverse osmosis. So they essentially came across, I don't want to say stumbled across it because they're good engineers and they thought it through, but they realized one of the opportunities to really do double duty is to do energy production and fresh water production. So it's a wonderful technology to think about for island applications. Of course, islands get you into thinking about places where fossil fuels are often more expensive than today, than today and to thinking about mini grids and smart systems on the small scale that might be coupled together. And so some of the types of systems that we can hope to learn from overall is not just hooking together large energy systems and both, for example, North America and Europe have plans for very low carbon economies decades hence, but how we can learn from what's going on not only in small islands, but also from the energy needs in developing countries where, for example, some of the solar cells we heard talked about um, already can be used in very small matches, batches to be doing small amounts of lighting or cell phone charging or ramping up productive energy use at the, at the community level. So there's very many aspects of this energy equation. Uh, we have, again, experts in the room, and I'd like to conclude before I thank our speakers, both thanking our hosts at AAAS for, for setting this up. Um, but also for our physical host today, which is the, uh, which is the Citrus program here at, at UC Berkeley. Actually, it's, it's one of four universities tied together in a, in a center uh, for technology research in the interest of society. And again, I'd like to finish, uh, conclude by thanking our speakers, Dr. Kim McGreeny, um, Dr. Belinda Batten, um, Dr. Henry Hsu, and Dr. Paul Olivasatos. Thank you all, and I hope you'll stay for the reception. Thank you.